So first, I'm getting the opportunity today to say thanks to the church, the administration, and the planning committee for putting on an indescribable 40th anniversary. Sometimes as a preacher you feel so discouraged and you think your work is in vain. But then the Holy Spirit revives the soul again. So I have altered that quote and said that my church revived my soul again. I don't even know how to say thanks, but in the words of Michael Manley, thank all I want to. <laughs> Certainly appreciate it. And my children, too. Uh, some of the most disadvantaged members in a congregation are the pastor's children. They see everything, they hear everything, and they know everything. And my children were especially very grateful that there are those who appreciate their father's hard labor. Sometimes to their disadvantage. And so in my new book coming out, I've written, If I Were to Do Ministry Again. But one of the first things in that book is that if I were to do it again, I would pay more attention to family. Because when the church is done with you, they are done. And all you have is family. You think you'll read it if I publish it? But I must say, I have received exceedingly abundantly beyond expectations from my ministry here. When I was coming here, a lot of people who knew Concourse, I didn't, called me and prayed for me. <laughs> and God has answered their prayers. <laughs> I think, with all honesty, I can say I couldn't have had it better. I'm not looking for floristune pathways. You won't find it on this side of Jordan. But each of you is special to me. Each of you is special to me. I hold Precious memories of you in different ways. But well, each of you is special. And in my heart, there rings a melody. A melody of love for all of you. Thank you so much for making me feel special. One of my colleague pastors that was here called me the day of after and he said to me pastor I sat there like a jealous man and wish that I could pass the church that ever showed me so much respect when I'm gone I might send him here
Another friend of mine said to me, Pastor, I sat in that church that day and I looked around and I didn't see a casket. And I'm glad you could smell the flowers while you're alive. Amen. So, thank you all. Thank you all. Last week, I had the sad pleasure of burying a colleague's wife. We have been praying for the Baileys in this church, on the prayer line, but the good Lord didn't seem see it wise to repair. And so after less than six months of diagnosis, he went to sleep. And I was glad I could be there to help to lead him through the valley. I know the territory. And so life goes on in endless song amid earth's lamentations. I went to the church I pastored and I saw a little old lady. She was old enough when I was there. And I left there 37 years ago. And when I saw her and greeted her, she said, is this B.L. Robinson? I said, yes, it is. She remembered me. She was slightly bending with age, and she's in her 90s now. And she said, I'm still here. I'm still here. And in her little smile, she said, I'm not going anywhere soon. <laughs> you know, it's a privilege to be alive. And it's a privilege not only to be alive, but to be alive in Christ. Amen. So I was trying to figure out what to preach today. And I started to think about being rich. How does it feel? John, I didn't come to you to get lessons because I came back late. But I was thinking about being rich. I remember the first day I became a millionaire. It was in 1975 I became a millionaire. That year, I bought my first pair of shoes for myself for $10,000. When you're rich, you don't buy cheap stuff. <laughs> and I bought a suit for $25,000 that lasts me for a lot of years. I became a millionaire in Mexico City. I took with me the allowable 50, 50 Jamaican dollars. And I became a millionaire in Mexico City. So I have a feeling of what riches is like, I've become the poorest in America. For some of you, in case you don't know it, there are some places you could go and live richer. 
Not here. Money here is ungrateful. He doesn't want to stick around with you. And so in talking about riches, I developed this sermon out of a visit I made to an old member. When I visited the family, when I pastored them, they were living in a little board house. When I visited them this weekend, they were living in a nice house. And he said to me, I live in this and I live off this. They were living downstairs and upstairs was rented to tourists. And he began to tell me the story. And when he was true, he said, if nobody else can tell you, I'll tell you this, that serving Jesus really pays. Amen. And he told me about the struggles. But he said, all the way my Savior lead me, what have I to ask beside? Paying, serving Jesus really pays. We went home tonight and my wife and I were talking and like Ella Malcolm, I couldn't sleep the night. So I was reading and I came upon this text about riches that I'm going to spend a few minutes delving into with you this morning. Would that be all right? I think sometimes when we come to church, we should at least go home feeling not poor. The unsearchable riches of Christ. I don't just want you to take your Bibles to church and don't use them. So I'd like you to take your Bibles or your device and go back with me to the text that was read in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. It was written by Paul. And Paul was not ashamed to say who he was. First thing he placed on the table. And I think he did it because he wanted you to track him. He said, firstly, I am a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, Paul was saying, from where Christ has brought me, from prison to preaching. I'm not sure my conference committee would employ a certified prisoner to be a pastor. But Paul said, that's where my journey began. I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ, but I have heard of the dispensation of grace. The church is full of a lot of disgrace but the church needs to know that you can have grace in place of disgrace. Paul says, I have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which can be given to anyone. He has made revelations to me. Verse 3. And he said the revelations that I have had, I cannot comprehend because they are mysteries. Some things that God has done for me, I can't explain why me. Paul says, this great revelation has helped me to understand 
that there is no classism and there is no racism when it comes to God. The Jews and the Gentiles are alike. We all need grace. We are all, and he used a word there that is, that is interesting. If you're reading from my version, which is the NIV, he says, we are fellow hearers. We are equal partakers of this grace. We need to preach that. It's available to us. We are fellow members of the body of Christ. We are partakers together of the promises of Christ because of the gospel. And then he goes down. He says, because of this in verse 7, I have been made a minister according to the gift of that grace of God which was given to me according to the working power of God. And here is verse 8 now where the riches come in. Unto me, Paul says, unto me. I can't talk about you, but I can talk about me. Unto me, who is no less than the least of all the saints, was this grace given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Seeing Christ and meeting Christ is a profound experience. Meeting Christ not only affects us, but it infects us. Meeting Christ not only informs us, but it transforms us. Am I talking to somebody here this morning? To me, Paul says, starting off as a prisoner, here I am now as a pastor. All because of grace. All because of grace, I can now preach to the Gentile the unsearchable riches of Christ. I was trying to understand the text, Pastor, and I was trying to milk it. And I tried to find a definition for unsearchable. And unsearchable in the original language seems to suggest the more you search for it, is the more elusive it becomes. You can't understand it. You can't wrap your mind around it. The unsearchable riches of Christ. And Paul... Preached nothing but Christ. Every sermon we preach, I was taught in homiletics, should be a road that leads to Christ. If the preacher preaches and Christ is not lifted up, he has not preached. He has lectured. If you preach about the Sabbath, it must not be dry ritualism. Every Sabbath must remind us that Jesus Christ is Lord of the Sabbath. If you preach about the sanctuary, it must not be about 538 BC to 1844, dry historical stuff. When we preach the sanctuary, it must remind the people that there is a Christ in the heavenly sanctuary mediating for us. When we preach the spirit of prophecy, it must not be that a woman was born called Ellen White who received spiritual gifts. No, when we preach about uh, the, the gift of prophecy, it must be all the revealed will of Christ to whomever he reveals that will. Yes, when we preach about food, it must not be about just pork and shrimp. It must be that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost and whatsoever you do, you must do to the glory of God. Every road must lead to Jesus. 
And when you are in Christ, you are not poor, you are rich. Paul said, I am so glad that I've been moved from prisonship to pastorship. And I'm going to use every energy to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then I try to figure out what are these unsearchable riches of Christ. And I came up with seven propositions. Number one, they are riches of heavenly knowledge. Man, when you read about when you read the scripture, you'll find out that this earth is not our final home. There's a place called heaven. And if heaven is a dream, don't wake me. There is a place called heaven. I was telling you about my friend who now lives in his house and live off his house. He told me, Pastor, like you Americans, I don't have a mortgage. Build his house without mortgage. We, we struggle for 40 years now yes. to pay a mortgage. But when we get to heaven, we're going to get mortgage-free mansion with debt-free utilities. Paul says, I preach that because I don't want the people of earth uh -uh, to be so stuck down here that they take their minds up there when I lift up Christ the things of earth must grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The riches of heavenly knowledge. He's talking also not only about the riches of heavenly knowledge, but he's talking about the riches of redeeming love. I was reading a book written by Dwight Moody and he said God was willing to bankrupt heaven to save one such as I. He was willing to bankrupt heaven to serve one such as I. You call that redeeming love. I don't deserve it, but he gives it. Then there is the riches of pardoning mercy. Some of us can't forgive. We carry all grudges. But Jesus never, 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 never carry all grudges for us. Even when we don't deserve it, when we have run out of grace, he chips in mercy. That's riches. Riches of sanctifying grace. The unmerited favor of Christ. I can't buy it. I can't earn it. But I can get it. And then there's the riches of consolation and hope. There is something beyond here that is worth living for. Let me tell you something. If you never had a thing called hope, you would have been so much more miserable. We've got something to look for, something to long for, and something to hope for. That makes us rich. Uh, my, my blood pressure has been a constant. 120 over 80. It has always been. And I have some colleagues who are living on pills. The only pill I live on is gospel. Because as you all know, worry is not a part of my vocabulary. I worry don't pay my bills. And worry don't fix anything for me. So I don't worry. Some of you would like to see me worry? Try eat your heart out. I am not going to worry. Why worry when you can pray? Some of you can't. Some of you sitting down in church right before me today. Worrying about the mortgage coming up. Worrying about the rent coming up. Worrying about the next semester at school. Let me tell you something. You must have the consolation of hope. 
that he is able to take care of all of your life situation. And then you must have the riches of immortality and glory. Yo, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you something. When this life is over, it should not be over. Did you hear me, Marty? When this life is over, it shouldn't be over. There must be something better coming. Life eternal. Can you imagine living for all, my, all your life? And enjoying it? And wake up one morning and know that you will never have to worry? There are some people who won't just leave my phone alone. They are calling me, offering me debt plan. They call it pre what? Pre, pre, pre something. I'm not spending my life worrying about death. When I die, I must be buried. <laughs> if you seem to collect collection, I, I ain't gonna be. I am not worrying about death. You want me to take my upfront money to pay pre plan? I'm planning for heaven. I don't need insurance. I need the blessed assurance that Jesus is mine. Pauls have got to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. Unsearchable. The God who made the universe, the mighty creator of the heaven and the earth, the one who sets the stars in place, the, the immensities, the galaxies, the, the one who, who, who has gifted to us life eternal. That's what we must preach about. It took a miracle. To hang the world in space, but when he saved my soul, cleansed and made me whole, it took a miracle of love and grace. How did you know that was in my notes? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Listen, I don't take preaching lightly. I, I don't, I would never fool myself in believing that. I'm a great preacher. But I, I, I can pride myself in believing that I can be great. Because when I preach Christ, that's greatness. Hmm? I don't take preaching lightly. Because every time I come around the podium, I know there are judgment-bound souls who need a lifeline. I've got to preach and lift him up. Because what did he say? When I am what? Lifted up. I will do what? Draw. draw how many? All. All people unto me. I can't do drawing. But Christ can. Christ can. So I don't take preaching lightly. And Paul didn't either. And I don't preach scholarship. I preach salvation. Scholarship enlightens the mind, but salvation converts the soul. I don't preach current event. I preach Christ. Because current event sends up your blood pressure. If you listen to Fox and MSNBC and CNN, you won't sleep at night. But when you preach Christ, you sleep like a baby. Am I, am I speaking sense here or nonsense? So I preach Christ and him crucified. And Paul had that philosophy too. He said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And he said also in 1 Corinthians 2, I am determined to not to know anything among you, save who? Jesus Christ and him crucified. You see, Paul was overwhelmed with God's grace. He couldn't stop preaching it. He mentioned it over and over. He said, this grace was given to me to preach to the Gentile the unfathomable riches of Christ. Paul knew that the only reason he could preach Christ was because God had given him grace. God had given him grace. When you pray for the lost, pray that they will come to a conviction 
of their sins and need Jesus. A man by the name of Spurgeon. Let me see. I have it here in my note. Uh, serve, uh, Spurgeon put it this way. He said, preach as if a man has a tight rope around his neck. They will not weep for joy unless the Savior cuts it and let them free. Pray. Pray that unbelievers will read God's word. That the Holy Spirit will convict them. That their guilt will stand before them in the sight of God. And instead of feeling condemned, they can feel transformed. The closer you get to God is the more you will feel the tension. Feel the tension. We, we, we are out of balance spiritually. And the unfathomable riches of Christ are only offered to sinners. Did you hear me? The unfathomable riches of Christ are offered only to sinners. And when sinners see, they will sing, draw me nearer, nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where thou hast died, draw me nearer. Nearer, blessed Lord, to thy precious bleeding side. So here's my thesis for you today. If you have Jesus Christ, you have everything. And if you have everything, you are spiritually blessed. And if you are spiritually blessed, you are rich. Somebody didn't hear me. You are rich. Do you know, a few weeks ago, there was World Cup. And a lot of people mortgaged their house to support the bookies. I went down to Jamaica, and a lot of my friends told me they lost money because they betted on Brazil. And Brazil lost. The stock market has gone down because Trump has levied taxes on uh, China. And they are fighting back. And a lot of the rich people have had a drop in their investments. Do you know a lot of Rich people, when you are sleeping at night, are up trying to figure out a way to get your money the next day. And when they can't get it, you hear on the news, they have cardiac arrest. And some of you, here's my consolation for some of you today, who think you are poor. Let me tell you something. You have what the world doesn't have and what the world needs. Don't sit down and wallow in pity. Don't throw yourself pity party that you don't have bank books and you don't have money in the bank and you, don't, you have not had the American dream. You have ended up with the nightmare. Keep your eyes on things above. Revel in the riches of Christ. God has given us everything we need to make us happy. I used to think I was the poorest of the poor, you know. My, my classmate is here. We had a place at school, school bottom. And lunchtime, we used to carry a little thing to school called carrier. You know, you know, you ever carry your carrier? Yeah, yeah. These little ones don't have a clue what I'm talking about. We used to carry carrier. And my grandmother would get up early morning to prepare lunch. And God bless what the lunch was sometime. A little kalalo. A little piece of bami. Yeah, yeah. A few sprat. Bami. And we thought we were poor. And when it's corn time, she would bake corn, this and corn, that. You know, blessed corn. You got so much out of it. Porridge, hominy, porn, you know, things, dumpling, 
and we thought we were poor. Now we hear them talking about organic. Huh? I remember our fowls would lay under the house bottom and we would sell the egg and go to supermarket and buy white egg. <laughs> we thought we were poor. But that's why some of us who are poor are living so long because now that I've come to America, I find out that we were not poor. The things I used to eat are costing the most in the supermarket. And some of you sit down here and think you are poor. I'm here to give you news this morning. If you are in Christ, you are not poor. You have riches. Count your blessings. And it will surprise you what the Lord has done. Paul said, man, I, when I found out that I'm rich, I, 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 I preach the gospel. I bring good news. The gospel is not about rules and regulations and rituals. It's about a knowledge of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I want to please him. I count everything lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord, for whom I have been crucified. I have lost a lot for him, but that's rubbish. I ran into a young lady I baptized some years ago, Carla in Maypan, Manchester Road. That's Carla City. I ran into her. Let me tell you her story. She was a Baptist, great Christian in her church, till I got to Manchester Road. And she decided to accept Christ. She was working at the bank as an entry-level teller. And when they heard she became Adventist, they would put her to work every Saturday morning from 9 to 1. And she told them she can't take on that shift because she's now an Adventist. And they gave her the first warning when she missed the first week. And the sec they wrote her up. The second week, they called her in and suspend her and said, if you don't come next week, we're going to fire you. And the third week, she didn't go. They fired her. A good girl working in the bank, standing on the promises of Christ. And she came to me and she told me her story. And we prayed together and I said to her, I remember that day under the guango tree, I said to her, leave it in the hand of God. You're not going to be the worst for it, sweetheart. And I believe that with all my heart. You can't, God can't tell me that he's my father and I'm an obedient child and I suffer. That's not the God I serve. Well, they fired her. Another bank was employing and she applied and she got a job and she told them, I can take the job if you'll promise me I don't work on Sabbath. They gave her the job. She stayed in that bank and worked her way up till now she is manager of the bank. Now, I contend that some of you need to be fired. <laughs> so, some of you have been holding on to minimum wage job when God has better for you. So, some of us be, be, behave like our Heavenly Father is dead. But I'm here to tell you this morning, he is not dead. He is alive. And the only reason why some of us are not better off is because we are trying to make life on our own. When we put God in the picture, everything will be added unto us. The, 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 the gospel tells us that Jesus Christ possessed in himself unfathomable riches and he gives these riches to all who call on him. 
My grandmother died at 99 years, 7 months and 21 days. And she never had a bank account. Mm -mm. You would never find her name in a bank. She saved all her money in her Brazil. Never join a bank. But happier woman you couldn't find. Jesus Christ, listen to this again. Jesus Christ possessed in himself unfathomable riches and he gives these riches to all that call upon him. So Sunday evening I was at my homestead and my aunt called me in the bedroom for a little talk, Vida. And she said to me, you see that little attache over there? If anything happened to me, all the important papers are in it. And she gave me the code to open the attache. And is me one have it? <laughs> and she began to tell me what's in there. And I, I wasn't interested in the story because I don't know why she's counting down. And she began to tell me. And she told me that there are 15 bank books in there. Yes. One for each of us as children and one for our children. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how much money in each book. <laughs> but it's not an ordinary person who has 15 bank books. She does simple things, sell our goat, sell our corn, sell, and she put away for us. Now, if my aunt can think about us and save for us, is that aunt, you know? Yes. Don't you think a father mm -hmm. would better that? Of course. And if Jesus is my father, can you understand how much bank book he has in glory? And he has one for me. All that call up on him. Unfathomable. Let, let's pack that word. Inestimable. Let, let's pack that word. Uh, infinite. Uh, un, 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 undescribable. You, you can't figure it out. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 2 verse 9, 2 Corinthians 8 9, For you who know the grace of God, Jesus Christ, know this, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that through your poverty you can have riches. Praise God. I don't walk around and beg nobody nothing. I don't plan to. I hope I don't have to. Thanks for all the gifts you give me. I have space for more, but I won't beg it. Do you see where Paul is going? That I was a prisoner, now I'm a preacher, all because of the grace of God. And because I accepted that grace, I now have unfathomable riches. Huh? That I, I, he says, I have it so much that Jesus Christ took my poverty and give me his riches. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Jesus took. Some of you wouldn't even marry a poor guy. <laughs> right, Carla? Wouldn't marry. <laughs> but Jesus took poverty so that I can be rich. Huh? You call that unfathomable. You can't get to the bottom of the word. Huh? And it's the only time, it's the only time in scripture you find it. Describing the grace of God. Unfathomable. That's your new word. My son is, is, doing, is doing a little thing that he says he's learning a new word every day. 
So every morning he gets up and says, Daddy, the word for today is. Learn it. And I would say, where you got that, son? I heard it on radio. Or I read it in the book. Or I was on the web and I saw it and I didn't know what it meant. He's learning. So he says, at the end of the year, I must know at least 365 new words. So your new word for today is unfathomable. You, you go down, dig, dig, dig. And the more you go, you can't get to the bottom. You can't get to the bottom. It's unfathomable. The more you try to understand God's word, is the more unfathomable it is. The more you try to understand God's love, the more unfathomable is it. We used to sing it in AY. It is so tall, you can't get over it. So broad, you can't get around it. So deep, you can't get under it. That's unfathomable love. And those who love Christ, We'll become rich. And when we become rich, we receive a gift called redemption. Ah, he, he redeems us. He adopts us. You, you, do you know that Christ predestined every one of us to be saved? None of us was made to be lost. And even though we played a fool and became runaways, he ran us down and found us and brought us back and gave us a sense of purpose so that we can understand the mystery of redeeming love. Ephesians 1 verse 9 says he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in us. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good work, which God prepared beforehand beforehand so that we can walk with him and then finally that great God has made an eternal inheritance for us that give us hope how many of us will be able to die and leave anything for our children I don't know but Christ has left for us an eternal inheritance yeah it would be Foolish for us to remain in our state of poverty when he's offering us riches. Wouldn't it be? That unfathomable riches he wants to bestow upon you. How do I get it, you asked me this morning? Just come to him. Come and begin to enjoy the treasure. That you will go on discovering more and more throughout eternity. If I give some of you here today a million dollars, by the end of the year you'll blow it. Yeah. I told you about the lady that got the money from England. And she said, what are they disturbing me for now? What must I do with this? I don't know anything. I'm talking about thousands. She's entire, she's, she, she used to get $4, four, do, $4 for NIS. I know she's getting thousands. She's a pastor. I don't know why they're bothering me with it, you know. Because I don't know what to do with this now. <laughs> well, let me tell you something. <laughs> when God is ready to pour out blessings on you, you don't know what to do with it. Mm? Why would you want to remain in poverty when he is offering you riches? It would be unthinkably foolish to hear that a man is offering you free treasure. And you stay away in your poverty and tell him you are too busy to come. It would be an insult if the master of the universe offers you free custom built mansion and you reject it to stay in your ghetto. Christ offers himself freely to every sinner. He has unfathomable riches to bestow on you for the asking. How do I get it? Come to him. Just come and begin to enjoy it. And I go home. Man, it's, it's good to go home, you know. You, you eat some things you haven't eaten for a long time. I just walk around and I just see things here and I pick. You know, a banana here. And if you eat mango, mango there. And fish over there. 
And, and bam, my house always have something, Vida. Always have something. Always have something. And when I go home, I don't say, can I have, can I have a, a Sprat? No. I, 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 I just walk around and pick. Huh. When you get over to glory, friends, you, you don't have to ask for anything. Everything is yours. You just walk around and enjoy it. Because you are joined here with Jesus. All right. John Newton. Anybody ever heard about John Newton? I close with a story I read just this week. I was reading John Newton. He was a drunken slave trader who himself experienced the unfathomable riches of Christ. What a way when you meet Christ, how your life is transformed. Some of you, hey, some of you, if you had continued on the trajectory you were going before you find Jesus, you would have been wrecked. Maybe you wouldn't even be here. You would be a wazza. But what a difference Jesus makes to your life. Has he made a difference to your life? John Newton was a drunken slave trader who experienced the unfathomable riches of Christ and became a pastor and an author. Did you know it was John Newton who wrote the song Amazing Grace? He put a plaque over his head in his office quoting Deuteronomy 1515. Thou shalt remember that thou was a bondsman in the land of Egypt and the Lord thy God had redeemed thee. He wrote that over his, over his head in his office. But later in life, a pastor friend noticed that Newton was showing signs of old age and came to him one day and said to him, when are you going to stop preaching? What? John Newton replied, shall the old African blasphemer stop while he can speak at all? And he wrote his own epithet. He said, when I'm dead, this is what is to go on my gravestone. John Newton, clerk, once an infidel, a servant of slaves in Africa, was by the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ preserved, restored, pardoned, appointed, and anointed to preach the faith that I had long labored to destroy. Later in life, before he died, he wrote these memorable words. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things. Number one, that I am a great sinner. And number two, that Jesus is a great savior. Yeah, Newton knew that the sin was forgiven. Newton knew that he was now a child of Christ, living a rich life. Friends, today I want you to go home contemplating the unsearchable riches of Christ. Remember, Jesus loves you. Sing it wherever you go. Talk it wherever you go. Live it wherever you go. That I'm a child of the King. With Jesus my Savior. I'm a child of the King. God bless you. And live a rich life. A full life. And a free life. In my prayer in Jesus name.